focus on freedom and how we as uh, followers of Jesus can live our lives unleashed. Oh, no, no, I'm just whining. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and you shall receive. <laughs> that takes away my gripe and complain. So, um, anyway, so we're in the middle of this series of freedom and being unleashed and uh, thinking about what holds us back and, and how we can communicate uh, the good news of uh, life in Jesus Christ and how we can communicate that in a way that, that frees people up and releases them and not shuts them down and makes them feel worse about everything. And, uh, and so uh, the passage of this morning we're going to look at is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. And, and as I was preparing uh, for today, I realized that this was the passage was my very first sermon at University of Presbyterian in 1982 or something like that. My very first sermon, I was assigned this passage, and I went, wow, let's see if I still believe it. <laughs> let's test it. So anyway, uh, Paul's writing to the Christians in the, in the town of Corinth, and uh, I'll, I'll ramp up a little with the last verse from the chapter before. We are not peddlers of God's word like so many, but in Christ we speak as people of sincerity, as people sent from God and standing in his presence. Then he writes, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we don't need to some do letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you know that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we're confident of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our confidence is from God, who's made us confident to be ministers of a new covenant. Not, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Let's skip down to verse 12. So, um, since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, putting it down there, you know, uh, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened, indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over the minds. And when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Lord, teach us from this. Teach us how we might uh, exude your Spirit, and how we might uh, be the men and women who are uh, living letters to the folks around us. And uh, we pray that you would draw us to yourself, and in doing that, show us a whole new freedom in our lives and in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, letters are, anybody ever get a letter? Nobody? Jonathan, thank you. You know, I didn't really talk to you, buddy. <laughs> There's something about, you know, I know that we get a bunch of junk, you know, in our mailbox, but it's still this kind of new thing to kind of, we have to drive to our mailbox, but, but when we drive to it, we go, maybe there's something here, you know. And uh, it always makes it feel good, you know, if there's some note or letter or something that, that's meaningful. Um, Paul, writing here to the Corinthians, understood probably more than any of us the value and the significance and the power of letters. In fact, uh, his contribution to the whole New Testament there, they're all letters that he wrote. Many of them written from prison, but but writing to encourage, to correct, to affirm, to uh, empower. Uh, he used letters uh, pow very powerfully, and uh, and so now he's writing one, and he's saying to them, "You, you followers of Jesus, are uh, letters. You're a letter." Not written with ink, but written with the spirit of the living God. Um, and I start thinking, what, what kind of letters are we then? Um, 
Have you heard of that thing, email? Have you heard of them? Get the, you know, you young people. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is about email, I was really excited when email came out, you know? And uh, and then it just started filling up with, with junk mail, you know, spam. And uh, and I love spam, I read the real spam. I'm not bad mouthing, you know, Minnesota, their foodstuffs. But um, I'm talking about spam and uh, even with spam filters designed by brilliant people, it still comes through, right? And, I, and, uh, and then I go to our mailbox and we've got physical spam letters in the mailbox. Just junk, you know? Uh, and it's usually bold and brash and attention uh, getting and promising everything and meaningless. And then I started thinking about the church. Couldn't help it. I started thinking, how much of our communication uh, in the world and in the, to the people around us is really just kind of a Christian spam? Where we're, oh yeah, yeah, God loves you, you know, I don't know. Or uh, Jesus said, we have a rainbow head, remember in the sporting events, rainbow head with John 3, 16, and nobody knew what the hey he was talking about. <laughs> you know, but, uh, and he was crazy. I think he went to prison then. Uh, <laughs> hope he kept the wig. But, um, you know, that's just Christian spam. You know? Uh, I remember you, you could, used to be able to drive through the country and there'd be big rocks on the side of the road and then somebody would have spray painted, Jesus is the answer. And I always wonder what the question was. <laughs> you know, they never had the question. The answer to what? Uh, I don't know. That, that's, that's kind of spamish, isn't it? Um, but there's another kind of letter that I receive anyway. Uh, bills. <laughs> Do you ever get bills? And these can come in email also yeah. and snail mail. Sometimes both, depending on how late we are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just a reminder to check your email because you know. Uh, and and what's the message of a bill? You owe. You owe. Yeah, you're indebted, pay up. Sometimes there's gonna be a penalty if you don't pay. Now, the weird thing is, what if you've already paid it? You still get this tightness in your stomach like, oh, <clears throat> maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I had one, this, this lady was calling me. At first I got a letter from her, uh, a hard copy letter. And then I got some email saying, you owe $214 back in August. And we are kind enough to not impose a late charge penalty on you for the next 10 days. But then we are going to be putting the late charge penalty on you. I thought, oh my golly, I forgot to pay this. Then I went, look, no, actually, it cleared the bank July 31st, the day before August. So I wrote to her and said, oh, I've got good news for you. You've already been paid. You paid. She wrote back, no. You owe $214. Yeah, that's what I wrote. But you owe it for August. Yeah, I sent it to July 31st. You know, you're all done. Well, you had to have the account number on the check. Well, I'm pretty sure it was there. Maybe not. I don't know now. So I go, well, what can I do? She said, well, you'll have to produce the check showing that we received it and cashed it. So I went to the bank and I talked with them and they did a bunch of fidgeting stuff on the computer and printed me out the check and back of the check showing that it had been cashed. And it had the account number on it and my name and the address and everything. So I sent a copy of it off to her, and, I was, and I've been waiting now for two weeks for her to write back and say, hey, thanks a lot. We took care of it. Thanks for paying it early. Everything's okay. I'm still waiting. <laughs> Not a word. Not, it was always my problem. You know, see, that's the thing about a bill. No matter what, even if you're right, even if you don't owe, it's you. That's the message of the bill. 
I grew up in a time in the, in the church when it seemed like the preacher was always saying, it's you. I had that, man. Whoa, and I believed him. Because when you point down the middle, it looks like, if you're sitting out there, it looks like I'm pointing at you. <laughs> I'm pointing at the table back there, but it looks like I'm pointing at you. And so we do this finger pointing thing as our message. And uh, it's kind of scolding, kind of guilt inducing, and we're nothing but a bill. What other kind of mail can you say? Well, there's spam, but another thing that's not really spam, that's not really a bill, is, uh, have you ever gotten a form letter? Form letters look real, don't they? And they got your name on them. And sometimes now with a computer, you know, you, you, they can insert your first name kind of intermittently through the letter. Cool. And then they have that signature, the pink thing that looks like ink. You know, I got one this week from a really a personal letter from President Jimmy Carter. <laughs> a lot of needs in the world, and, and President Carter wrote to John, signed it there, that ink thing, you know. I kept looking at it, did he really write me? I never even met him. <laughs> but he must know of me. <laughs> Probably knows of Harbor Church. He's read your book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, you know, this is a shock to you, I know. I think it was a form letter. <laughs> you know, and it's so disappointing when you go, oh, yeah, it's not real. I, I, I remember what I said, I've always remembered. Uh, when I was down in, in Walnut Creek, California, at the Presbyterian Church, that we called the church Walnut Creek Press. That, that's because Presbyterian could spell that. You know, that's a. I almost wanted to become Baptist just because it's easier to spell. But uh, so Walnut Creek Press, and I one day I got letters uh, offering a, a very uh, meaningful uh, service, um, and it was addressed. I think they thought press meant that I was the president. <laughs> Not in the United States, but Walnut Creek President. So they wrote me this letter, President Creek. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, there you go, President Creek. <laughs> and then, Dear Walnut. <laughs> offer this service, Walnut. <laughs> we can help you in very personal ways, Walnut. It's all through it. You know, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. And, and so, you know, uh, a form letter, it looks exciting at first because you think, okay, and no, it's not. What a disappointment. And how often as the way we communicated our faith and the freedom of life in Christ, and we can We've done it like a, a form letter. So people think, oh, it's something for me. And we, then we've done it in a way that doesn't communicate the fact that they're unique and unlike anyone else, a creation from God, a miracle, and they've got their own issues that need to be taken seriously, that God takes seriously, as, as we are saying today. Uh, it's just kind of out there. Dear Walnut. <laughs> well, at least they wrote to me. <laughs> so, our scripture says, you are a letter from Christ. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of God. Not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. That's the letter that we are. So that leads me to think, how do we communicate the freedom of God, in which our passage says, where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Not debt, not lumping everybody together, stereotyping, not spam. There's freedom, there's life. 
And then in the middle of this passage, it, it's kind of intriguing to me because in the middle of it, he goes off on this little tangent about Moses, you know, and ha and uh, is referring back uh, in the Old Testament. Moses uh, had, a, you know, gone up on the mountain in God's presence, and when he came back, it, it said that his face was was glowing, was shining, you know. And so people would come to see Moses with their issues; they want counsel and direction and all those kind of things, you know. And so they come in, they go, "Whoa, gee whiz, oh man, it's got to brighten here." So Moses came up with an idea. I'll put a veil over my face and I'll cover up the glow and everybody will be protected. Then they come and see me and I'll help them and they'll all know that I'm kind of glowing from being in God's presence, you know. I'm kind of special. And uh, but then the Bible says that the glow went away. It wore off. It went away. And Moses went, well, I don't want them to think that I'm just one of them. I don't want them to think I'm just a guy. So he kept putting the veil on every time anybody came to see him. So they would think that he was special. He was lying to him. He was pretending. He was a hypocrite. And Paul says, so often when we start to get religious, it's like putting a veil over us. We start to cover up. We start to pretend. We start to act like we're better than we are. We start to act like we're different than everybody else. And he says, we can, we can live our lives without the covering, without hiding, without pretending. We can be free from that. We can, we can live our lives in a way that we don't have to cover up and pretend and act like we're better than we are or different than we are because Jesus knows us for who we really are and this is the weird thing okay so get this message he loves you regardless even the way we are. That is so hard to understand, isn't it? He loves us the way we are. Not like if I get everything fixed up or covered up or shielded or protected or pretend to be a certain way, then, then I'm acceptable to God. No. In fact, the more we cover up, the more distant we are in our relationship with God and with each other. Right? He wants us to live free. He wants us to live uh, unleashed. And that means we don't have to pretend. We don't have to um, put on an act for everybody. And we sure don't have to put on an act for God. Now what would happen if, if we were like this passage talks about, if we were letters from Christ to the people around us or in our life that we bump into, would that have any effect? I don't know. You know, I started thinking about that. I thought, well, you know, I don't know. I feel like, you know, we don't have much influence. We're just a little church here, you know, and there's a few people that we know. And what, what could we do and all that kind of stuff? Now, I'm not a, a math guy, okay? In case you didn't know that. Uh, but I tried to do some math this week, okay? So work with me, please. What if, see, when, when we were starting the church, Damon was worried about me, and he said that I would crawl into a hole and die, basically. And because uh, I used to have, have the thing where I'd go into the office and my secretary would hand me the list of everyone I was meeting. And, what I was supposed to do, and then I just go through my day with, without deciding anything. Whoever showed up, that's good, you know. And uh, but but when we started the church, there was no church, and so there were no people, so there was nothing to do. And, and so Damien sat me down and said, "Okay, Dad, you have to have three incidents a day. So I don't care what they are. You have to have a conversation with someone. You have to." Uh, meet them at Starbucks or do something or have some kind of a significant thing. You have to have three of these a day. Which I thought was easy, but after a while, you know, you know I, I found out that talking to the 
cashier at the Safeway can be an incident, right? <laughs> How's it going? Tell me about, you know. And so, um, anyway, so um, what if we just took, you know, say we have three uh, conversations a day, different people, somebody you work with, a neighbor, uh, the cashier at Safeway or QFC, um, and you have a conversation, and you, and you ask them a question, and you get to know them, or they, uh, you, you have a little connection, right? Three a day. Okay, so if I did that three times a day, now here's where the math comes in. If you do that every day for a week, that'd be seven times three. Any, any, 21. <laughs> <laughs> now, just to make this easier, let's round that off to 20, because you know, <laughs> you may have not done so well, you know. Uh, okay, so you have 20. That's easy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you do that, um, uh, how many weeks in a year? <laughs> <That this year? laughs> uh, 52. Well, Kim says on the phone. That's yeah. not real, that's not on the phone. <laughs> 52. 52. Okay, now, everybody, you know, you've got to have a couple weeks vacation, so you're not going to do anything, so let's make that 50, okay? So, okay, so you have 50 uh, times 20. What's that? Thousand. What? 1,000. 52,000. <laughs> she needs a new phone. <laughs> would, would that be, okay, what, what is it again? It's a thousand, one thousand. You've got your phone going, Chris. Okay, I said I wasn't good at this. I had to graduate from San Diego State in the business school the year before pocket calculators came out. With the slide rules, you know, it's terrible. Anyway, so that's why I don't do that. Okay, so, so that'd be a thousand times a year. Cool, right? And you go, that's really nice. And, but then you, know, you think, well, how many people? Maybe there's like 40 people here, depending on the week and stuff. So, okay, what's 40? If pe 40 people had these three encounters a day, you know, uh, for a year, what, what would that be? 40,000. You got your pencil? You're working that? Okay. 40,000. Is that right? Are they right? I question everybody at this point. Okay, whoever sits at fifty-two thousand. <laughs> I've run out of spaces. Uh, no. Okay, so that would be forty thousand living letters, right? And say we did that for five years or so. What would that be? Two hundred thousand conversations. Two hundred thousand. Experiences 200,000 opportunities to be a living letter from Christ. 200,000 encounters is a lot. I'm glad Damien didn't make me do that every day. 200,000 a day, that'd be a lot. That's a lot of coffee. <laughs> but, you know, okay, so, so what would happen? I think that that's enough to change our community. I think that's enough to change our lives. I think it's enough to change us, ultimately. Not as junk mail, not as spam, not as bills, but as living letters from Christ, showing that Jesus cares. We can affirm. We can call out the best in them. We can remind them that they're special. We can remind them that they're gifted. We can remind them that they're made by a God who loves them and knows them and calls them by name. All of that, 200,000 encounters. In less time than our church has even been around. I mean, I'm not getting crazy and saying we do this for like the rest of our life. You know, I'm just saying five years now. Anyway, it just struck me. God wants to change the world one little letter at a time. One little living letter. And the message through it all, because it's written by the Spirit of God, is what? Freedom. You're free. You don't have to hide. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to walk around wallowing in anything. You're free. And I gotta tell you, there's more than 200,000 people sitting out there wanting to hear that, needing to hear that really badly. Pray with me. Lord Jesus.
We thank you for your love. We thank you that you don't give up on us, and we thank you that you don't treat us all the same, and you don't remind us of our debt. But you call us to freedom, and you make it possible. And we thank you for that. So come into our lives, come into our hearts and our minds and our relationships and our conversations and transform us with uh, your grace and help us to be living letters. As you intended and as you keep writing on our hearts. And we'll give you the praise. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.